big warm welcome to a returning alumnus of NYU, Marty Hellman. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to make sure I stay on schedule by starting a stopwatch, and I'll leave that here, or I can consult it every once in a while if it doesn't fall down. Okay, so let's see. Here's the this. So for more details, by the way, you can see, go to my Stanford Publications page. If you have any trouble finding it, uh, Ted can direct you there. Uh, I've got my, the write-up of my uh, Turing lecture is there, and there are a number of other things as well, including uh, we were talking about the book my wife and I wrote, and there's a free PDF of it available uh, on that same publications page. But if you have any trouble, T Ted said he'd be happy to direct you there. So what are the goals of this talk? It's to pull back the veil on the development and the evolution of public key, or I guess you want me here, huh? Uh, cryptography. And I like the fact that people call it revolutionary, and please don't stop. But at the end of this talk, I hope you'll say, what took them so long? I mean, there are all these arrows pointing us, and I think this happens a lot in, in, in uh, major advances, that uh, people are caught in a, a rut that seems like a groove, uh, kind of like Einstein with um, uh, the uh, quantum mechanics, I mean, the photoelectric effect, the, the, physicists of the t physicists of the time were caught in this rut that they finally knew from Maxwell's equations that light was a wave, not a particle, and yet, of course, it behaves as both. The other goal is to honor some unsung heroes of public key cryptography. And there are always more people than could be recognized by a prize like the Turing Award, and I'll mention a number of these today. So one reason I'm talking historically is because I don't work in this area intensively anymore. In fact, I was asking questions of some of you guys, the faculty here at uh, NYU Engineering. Um, so let's see. Was public key cryptography revolutionary or evolutionary? Well, just like Planck, Planck discovered uh, the solution for black body radiation around 1900, and, but he didn't really believe it because that was going back to the time of Newton, and Maxwell had just shown 20, 30 years earlier that light was a wave. It took Einstein to take uh, the particle theory of light seriously. In the same way, August Kirchhoffs in 1883 had, point, had postulated some requirements for a good cryptographic system, and one of them was that all of the secrecy should reside in the key. You shouldn't assume there's any secrecy about the general system, the piece of hardware, the software, the standard, because clearly a standard cannot be secret. And so how can you have a public key when all of the secrecy has to reside in the key? Of course, you have two keys, a public key and a secret key. Let me see where I am. Yeah, we're doing okay. Um, yes, yeah, so I've already said that. Okay, so let's look at how it was evolutionary. Half of the concept, which is the privacy part, there's digital signatures and there's key exchange. The key exchange part occurred independently to three different groups almost simultaneously within a few years of one another. In addition to Witt and myself at Stanford, we had Ralph Merkel at UC Berkeley, and inter interestingly, he was an undergraduate student when he first came up with this idea, and then later a master's student. But nobody paid much attention to him, as you'll see in a later slide. And so I eventually kidnapped him, and he did his PhD at Stanford with me. And then James Ellis, Clifford Cox, and Malcolm uh, Williamson at the British equivalent of NSA, GCHQ, came up, again, only with the privacy part, not the, um, the digital signature part. But I'm not sure that they recognized the importance of it living in the classified military environment because there's a chain of command that limits the number of connections. The problem of key distribution is much larger in commercial applications where you have uh, anybody wanting to talk to anybody else. So here's a picture of Whit Diffie, uh, the guy with the long blonde hair, now it's long white hair, but he looks pretty much the same. Uh, I have less hair and I got rid of the beard, I'm in the middle, and that's Ralph Merkel on uh, your left. And I think he just looked a little older, but still the same. So let's look at the evolutionary aspect of uh, public key cryptography via a hierarchy. And this is in New Directions in Cryptography, the uh, prize-winning paper that uh, Whit Diffie and I had in the IEEE Transactions uh, on Information Theory in 1976. 
76, the November 76 uh, issue. And it's on my, you can get a PDF from my publications page. One of the things Witt and I realized is that there was a taxonomy or a hierarchy of cryptographic systems. And the simplest cryptographic system was a one-way function. <coughs> that's a function that's easy to compute but hard to invert. And this idea had existed for a number of years. It was used in the Unix operating system to protect passwords. You would take your password, put it through a one-way function, and store only that. The next level up that we could see was a conventional cryptographic system, often called a symmetric cryptographic system. The next level up that we saw was something called a trapdoor crypto system, and I should emphasize that no one knows even to this day how to build a trapdoor crypto system, but we saw that it was a very desirable type of system for reasons I'll mention in a minute. And the next level up, eventually we came to the public key or asymmetric cryptographic system. And let me see how I'm doing on time. Yeah, I think we're doing okay. I'm going to take a quick drink here because my getting over a cold. Yeah. <clears throat> so what's a one-way? Well, one way we saw that you could why, why one-way functions are simpler than a conventional or symmetric cryptographic system is you could always turn a conventional system into a one-way function, but you couldn't always turn a one-way function into a conventional system. So here we have, this says AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard. It's a conventional block system. You put something in the key port, you put something in the plain text port, and you get something coming out the ciphertext port. And so you put a fixed plain text, P0, like all zeros in the plain text port, you put X in the key port, and you take Y out the ciphertext port. Now, going from X to Y is easy. That's just an encipherment, which has to be fast. But going backward is determining the key from a known plain text ciphertext. That's cryptanalysis. It has to be hard. So you can always turn a block cryptographic system into a one-way function, which is why one-way functions are simpler. Trapdoors are usually associated with public key cryptography. In fact, people sometimes call them trapdoor cryptographic systems, which is actually not right. There is a trapdoor there, but trapdoors are fundamental to all cryptographic entities. And for example, you've all taken trapdoor quiz problems. These are exams where you slave away for an hour and you have trouble finding the answers. At the end of the hour, the professor says, OK, turn in your papers. Oh, we have two minutes left. And I'd like to not only give you the answers, but convince you they're right. Now, how does the professor do that in that short amount of time? Well, that's because there were many possible avenues that you could have taken, and you didn't know which one to take, whereas the professor had a specific route in mind. Now, um, you can really get an amazing trapdoor quiz problem where you could give the class millions of years to try to work on it, if, assuming we could live that long, and at the end of the million years, you could give them the answer and convince it's right in a few milliseconds. What you do is, and this actually goes back one step, yeah. uh, you would create a one-way function, like with AES, you'd, you'd, you'd pick an X, you, the professor, would pick X, compute Y, tell the class only Y, and say, find X. Well, that's a one-way function. They can't do it. But at the end of the million years, you could give them x and put it through the one-way function and show them that it gave you the correct y. And this is closely related to Stephen Cook's uh, p equal np question. Uh, and basically, loosely speaking, and it is loosely speaking, if the answer to this is no, uh, that is, if, I'm sorry, if p does equal np, then there are no secure cryptographic systems. But fortunately, most computer scientists believe p does not equal np. So what's a trapdoor crypto system? Information known only to the designer of the system has been built into it that allows him or her to quickly break the system. And you know it's there. I mean, but you can't find it. That's why it's called the trapdoor. I, I thought of the Hardy Boy mystery novels that I used to read as a kid. And they're trapped in this tomb, and there's a million bricks, and there's one that if you touch it, the door opens, and they get out. Well, a trapdoor cryptographic system would be a general's dream, or NSA's dream, because a general worries. I want secure encryption for my soldiers, but if my adversary, the woman sitting over there, you capture one of our systems, I don't want you using it for your soldiers in the field. 
And so I could use the trap door to break it, but since you don't know the trap door, you can't break our communications. Let me emphasize, we've never figured out how to build a system like this. We, we, when we looked at the data encryption standard, we saw some crude forms of trapdoor ciphers. But from a trapdoor crypto system to a public key exchange, that is exchanging keys, is a very small step. And we saw this, and this was one of the evolutionary directions of public key cryptography. If I have a trapdoor crypto system, what I can do is tell everybody, so now let's change you from my adversary to my friend. I want to communicate with you across this room, but everybody's listening in. So I tell you the trapdoor crypto system, but I don't tell you the trapdoor. I keep that information secret to myself. Everybody else learns the trapdoor crypto system. You then pick a random key. You don't tell it to me or anybody else. You cipher a message and send it to me. I can break it because I know the trapdoor information, but no one else can break it. And the message you send me says, use the following key for the rest of our communications. We just had public key exchange, one of the evolutionary steps in public key cryptography. So Whit Diffie and I developed the concept of a public key crypto system, whereas Ralph Merkel, independently as an undergraduate at Berkeley, came up with the idea of a public key distribution system and he actually had a proof of concept. It wasn't practical. It was a puzzle system. And it, it, today it might actually be somewhat practical because communications bandwidth was a key element. And in 1974 or 5, when Ralph came up with this, uh, you know, what were we limited to? Probably 2,400 bits per second, something like that. You know, whereas today we can get, I have gigabit per second uh, fiber to the home because I'm part of Google's uh, beta test for, for their uh, fiber to the home. Now, a public key crypto system is different. It doesn't just allow uh, the exchange of information. It allows digital signatures because it has two keys that are inverses to one another. And you can use one key to sign and the other to verify, or you can use one key to encrypt and the other to decrypt. And depending which one you make public, you can get signatures or uh, exchange of information with no prearrangement. Diffie, what's called Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange these days is a Merkel public key distribution system. I was trying to come up with a public key crypto system that Witt and I were working on, but we knew of Ralph's work at that point. We didn't early on, and he didn't know of us. And so I often call it Diffie-Hellman Merkel Key Exchange if names are going to be associated with it. This is, and let me see what I'm doing on time, 12 minutes. Yeah, I'm doing quite well. Um, this is Ralph's a project proposal for CS244 in the fall of 1974 at UC Berkeley. It was a computer security course and you had to do a term project. And so we had two pro project proposals. This project proposal is for establishing secure communications between separate secure sites over insecure communication lines with no prearrangement. It's public key exchange. And notice what the professor wrote. Project number two, which was much more mundane, and I haven't even, uh, that was a separate page. Project two looks more reasonable, maybe because your description of project one is muddled terribly. Talk to me about this today. <laughs> so what did Ralph do? He dropped the course and went to work on this anyway. The CACM rejected Ralph's paper initially. Uh, New Directions in Cryptography, where Witt and I, we credit Ralph, but you know, people often think we invented public key cryptography solely on our own, and we did invent the digital signatures uh, on our own. Even GCHQ didn't have that. But in public key exchange, or the public key distribution, Ralph really deserves equal credit. And yet his paper was rejected by the CACM. So his paper appeared about a year or two after ours, not, even though it was submitted before ours. And the editor wrote back, I was particularly bothered by the fact that there are no references to the literature. Has anyone else ever investigated this approach before? And the answer is no. <laughs> this was seminal research. She sent the um, paper to an experienced cryptography expert, was her description, who wrote the following in his review. The paper is not in the mainstream of present cryptography, cryptography thinking. I would not recommend that it be published. Well, Ralph persevered, and it was published, but it was delayed. Whereas our paper, uh, Jim Massey, who was the editor of the information theory transactions at the time, uh, he had invited me to write a paper on cryptography, and I'd asked if Witt could be co-author, and I, as I expected, uh, Jim said, sure. 
And we had the concept of public key cryptography at that point, but not the, a, a, not the, what's called Diffie-Hellman or Diffie-Hellman-Merkel key exchange. And uh, in June 1976, there was an international symposium on information theory in Ronneby, Sweden, and I'd come up with what's called Diffie-Hellman key exchange in May, late one night in my study at home, and I quickly added that to the talk, and it created a sensation at the conference, and Jim said to me, you get that in the paper, and I'll have it in the November issue of the transactions, and I think you all know how fast that is. Um, uh, Wit is fond of pointing out that the November 76 issue did not reach people in their mailboxes till January 77, but still, it was the November 76 issue. The RSA paper, uh, with the RSA system, uh, was also got very expedited review. I was one of the reviewers. The editor sends it to me and says, would you please review this as quickly as possible? This may be the most important paper we ever publish. How often do you get a letter from an editor like that? Whereas you saw what Ralph got from the editor of the CACM and why his paper was delayed. So the first unsung hero, or he's not unsung, but undersung hero of public key cryptography was Ralph Merkel. The second uh, unsung hero is John Gill. And this is John about 1976. He came on the faculty in 72. He has a PhD in math from Berkeley, but with Manuel Blum, who's usually in the CS department now at CMU. I went to John and I asked him, you're a better mathematician than me. I mean, he's a ma he was a math PhD. I'm looking for one-way functions. And of course, you start with the simplest entity, not the most complex. And so John suggested factoring integers, which we'd already thought of. Unfortunately, we missed the RSA system. Uh, and he said, well, what about indices after a little time? I said, what, what are indices? Well, they're what we call discrete logarithms today. The uh, y equal alpha to the x mod q, where q is a large prime number, is easily computed, much as alpha to the ninth does not take eight or nine multiplications. It only takes one, two, three, four. You square, you square again, you square again, you get alpha to the eighth. Then you multiply by alpha to get alpha to the ninth. In the same way, if you have a thousand bit or two, let's say, say a thousand bit modulus, it takes at most 2,000 multiplications mod q, and each time you reduce mod q so the numbers don't get bigger and bigger. So that's fast. But the reverse operation, which is known as the discrete log problem, is believed to be slow. Nobody, we've worked on it for decades. We keep finding better ways to do it, but the last major advance was 30 years ago almost, and uh, so hopefully um, it is hard. So here's a derivation of a conventional cryptographic system that most people have not heard of, but it's essentially the same as the RSA system, and we developed it several years before. We missed it. Uh, this was Steve Pollock and me. I was playing with the index function that John Gill had suggested, and I saw that going from alpha and x to y was easy because that's exponentiation. Going from alpha and y to x, the discrete logarithm problem is hard. Going from x and y to alpha is easy. I won't explain why, but it is. Then I wrote down, going, if you have a conventional cryptographic system, the only one of the three operations that's hard is computing the key from the plain text and ciphertext. That's cryptanalysis. So you've got one hard on top, one hard on bottom. So therefore, x would have to be the key. And the other two would be the plain text and ciphertext. I then came up. That's Steve Pollack soon after we did this work. Uh, he unfortunately passed away about a year ago, um, uh, fairly early, I think he was 64 years old. And so we had, the ciphertext was the plain text to the kth power mod q, because remember, x had to be the, k, uh, the key. Then the plain text is obtained by exponentiation as well, raising to some other power d. Now notice, if you put c, you substitute that c is p to the kth power, you get p to the kd power, right? So kd must be 1, because you want p to be the same as p to the kd power. In one of these Alice in Wonderland kind of things, when you do arithmetic mod q, in the exponents, it's done mod q minus 1, uh, Euler's uh, Toshin function. Uh, and so it turns out computing the deciphering exponent from the enciphering exponent is easy, so all this makes a very workable conventional cryptographic system. And I noted that q minus 1 is what's called phi of q, Euler's Toshin function. And that's important because when I compare this to the RSA public key crypto system, there are the three equations. Notice that they're almost exactly the same as what 
Steve Pollack and I had, the only difference is they called the enciphering exponent E instead of K, and they, Q is replaced as the prime number by a product of two primes. And what's critical is that to compute the deciphering exponent from the enciphering exponent, you need to know the factorization of N. Whereas if you know Q, you know Q minus 1. But if you know N, which you need to encipher, you don't necessarily know P and Q. And that's why their system worked. Now, the Pollock-Hellman paper appeared a few months after RSA, because remember, RSA got this expedited uh, publication, whereas our paper was much more mundane. Uh, ours was submitted about a year before it. I have to say, we totally missed RSA. I'm not trying to claim that we invented RSA. We missed it. And that's just another example of how a small way of thinking differently would have done it. And I think we missed it because I think we came up with the Pollock Hellman system before Witt and I had the concept of public key crypto system, so then we didn't go back adequately and look at it. So here's Ravest, Shamir, and Adelman, and let me see how I'm doing on time. Yeah, that's from 1977. Mm, slide 16, 19, yeah, we're doing okay. So that's them there when they were young. And you saw me when I was young. Uh, Diffie, so what's the Diffie-Hellman-Merkel uh, public key distribution system? Okay, so I observed that if we're going to have users, user one, two, three, and so on, then <clears throat> let's let yi, the public key, be alpha to the xi mod q. You can do that because it's easy to compute y from x. That's a one-way function, but hard to go in the reverse direction. So you could make y your public key and keep x as your secret key, and no one could compute your secret key from your public key. I then came up, and you'll, the next slide will show how, that the key that two users uh, use, so again, I'll pick on you. Uh, I'm one, and let's say you're 10. Use, the key that users one and 10 use are alpha to the x1, x10 mod q. And this can be computed two ways. I take y10, which is public, and can raise it to the x1 power that I know. She takes y1, which is public, and raises it to the x10 power that she knows. And you get the same result, because it doesn't matter if you raise alpha to the xi and then to the xj power or in reverse order, it's commutative. You get the same result. It's interesting that I was trying to find a public key crypto system based on discrete logs when I came up with this public key distribution system, which is a Merkle system based on discrete logs. Uh, yes, I think I've gone through this. Oh, but one of the key things is, you might say, why did it take me so long to find us or me so long to find this? Well, part of it is there are lots of permutations. Like in this case, late one night in May 76, so a month before the Ronneby Sweden Symposium, I said, well, let's let alpha and q be public. Notice that choice by itself, there were a number of permutations. Whoops. Sorry. I, I was hit the button by mistake. Yeah, so here we are. So let alpha and q be public, and just that by itself, I mean, there were so many ways to try it, and after a while you kind of give up, because you have tried this, why should I try that? But you have to keep swinging at these wild pitches to hit what I call a full home run. Um, and then computing y from x is easy, that's exponentiation. Computing x from y is hard, that's discrete log. So I then tried what xi be i secret key and yi be that person's public key. Then what eventually I tried, whoops, uh, the thing that I've told you before, raising your public key to my secret key power and you do the reverse. Okay, so who's unsung hero number four? Whoops, I need to be back in the light. Uh, Richard Tropel. How many of you have heard of Richard Tropel? Nobody. Okay. Now, Rich, uh, let's see, RSA originally, in the first version of their report, they didn't put version numbers on it, but uh, I think WIT has all the version numbers, and the earliest one used a 250, re recommended that the key be 256 bits long. When I got this, I wrote back to Ron Rivest, and I said, by the way, Rich Chopel thinks he can factor 256-bit numbers, so you should increase your key size. And in fact, uh, the quadratic sieve, you, how many of you have heard of Pomerantz and the quadratic sieve? Oh, a few. If in the tale of two sieves, Pomerantz credits Chopel's 
sieving method as being the inspiration, his exact word, for quadratic sieve. So most people don't realize that because Rich didn't like to publish, but he would circulate copies of his papers. And so Pomerantz, I'm sure, got one. I had one. Don Knuth had one and mentions it in his book. <coughs> and so they increased the... Uh, Reveshmir and Adelman increased their recommended key size to over 200 digits, and of course today we use more than that. Unsung hero number five, Lauren Kahnfelder. He developed the concept of digital certificates as an undergraduate student at MIT in his bachelor's thesis done under Len Adelman's direction. And this created the foundation for VeriSign and all other CAs, certificate authorities. And actually, I found Lauren. He's living in Hawaii, and he works on related things, and we struck up a conversation about a year or two ago. So let me turn to one of the last things I think I'll talk about. Let me see, I'm doing 25 minutes. Uh, yes, I'm going to shift gears. In parallel with these technical developments, there was a political fight that went on. Was our work born classified? So in March 1975, the government, through the Bureau of Standards, now NIST, uh, proposed a data encryption standard, or DES. Witt and I looked at it, and we quickly realized that its key size, while it appeared to be 64 bits, one of the first things the algorithm did was throw away 8 bits, which was a little suspicious. That made a 56-bit key size. And 2 to the 56 is the number of keys. That's roughly 10 to the 17th power. It's actually 7 times 10 to the 16th, but order of magnitude. Now, 100,000 million million keys sounds like a lot, but as we looked at it, we realized even in 1975, it was conceivable that you could do an exhaustive search at reasonable cost. And in particular, we postulated a chip that could search a million keys per second. You buy a million of these chips, how many keys per second are you now searching? 10 to the 12th. How long does it take to search 10 to the 17th keys? Just 10 to the 5th seconds, which order of magnitude is a day? I think it's 80,000 plus seconds. So we wrote to NBS about the bug, you know, the mistake. We said increase the key size, and it was easy, it was cheap to increase the key size. NBS wrote back to us saying, answering all our other questions, but not really answering this one. I think they said the standard is adequately secure for the purposes for which it was intended. That certainly became their line later on. So I hunkered down, and it's kind of funny. Witt was technically my student, uh, although, as I've said, uh, Witt can be nobody's student. He's uh, much too independent. Uh, and usually the professor has the high-level ideas, and the student does a lot of the grunt work. Witt did not do grunt work. I did the grunt work. So I sat down. <laughs> And I talked with the people in our integrated circuits lab, and I actually did a rough design of a search chip using roughly 1975 technology. It appeared in the uh, magazine Computer of the Computer Society of the IEEE, and it's on my publications website. You can look at it. We, I thought we needed to use silicon on sapphire to get a low power, but today, I mean, soon after, silicon became very usable. The bottom line is we estimated it would be $10,000 per solution, even with the technology of the time, and decreasing an order of magnitude every five years. Worse, if there were ever a shortcut that could be used, then it would totally <coughs> break the system. So we expected the Bureau of Standards to increase the key size, but they didn't. That's when we realized that it was a political problem, not a technical problem. It wasn't a bug. It was a feature. Why was it a feature? Because NSA could break it. They didn't want a publicly available standard that might be used by their foreign adversaries that they couldn't break, even if it meant that, that their foreign adversaries in not too many years, because we had a, an, a, an edge in computing power, uh, their foreign adversaries in five or ten years could break your medical records, uh, commercial secrets, etc. So in January 1976, after about uh, six months of writing letters to NBS and getting BS answers, uh, we were, Witt and I were preparing to go public. We realized we had a political problem, we needed uh, congressional hearings, we needed media coverage, and as we're getting ready to do this, two high-level NSA people uh, fly out from Maryland and meet with us. They're very nice because they're trying to win us over. They're trying to convince us to be quiet. And what they said is, continuing to talk this way will cause grave harm to national security. Now, my intellect told me the opposite, that NSA should not choose what the security level was. And so I went home that night to figure out the right thing to do. 
And I have a talk that I gave yesterday at Fordham on ethical decision-making, of which this was a key part. Here, I'll kind of summarize it. As I'm trying to figure out the right thing to do, the ethical thing to do, an idea bubbles up and pops into my head. Forget about what's right and wrong. You'll never have more of a chance to make a name for yourself. Run with it. Now, who in, what reasonable person, what other than a no-goodnik, would run with it if he might cause grave harm to national security. So at the time, I thought, well, I liken this in the movie where, you know, there's an angel on one shoulder whispering in the actor's ear and a devil on the other shoulder. This was the devil whispering in my ear. And I thought that I got rid of that devil and I made a logical, rational decision to go public with this. And fortunately, it was the right decision. And this is described in the... Uh, uh, my, the write-up of my Turing lecture. It's also described in the book that I mentioned in more detail because uh, this relates to my own personal evolution. Uh, but five years later, uh, oh yeah, first before I get that, May 1976, when I came up with what's now called Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange, this increased NSA's concern because people could change keys really rapidly and so even $10,000 per solution, if we were right, was a high barrier. July 1977, J.A. Meyer, from his home address in Maryland, writes a letter to the IEEE. As an IEEE member, I'm concerned that you, uh, the, the organization is violating the law by publishing certain papers. And it's funny how when you get to talk about cryptography, everyone talks in code. So Meyer didn't say, you're publishing Hellman's papers. He said, certain issues, and then he listed about five or six journal issues. I had a paper in all but one. And the IEEE writes back to him in code. I mean, this uh, says, thank you very much. We're well aware of this law. It's called the International Traffic and Arms Regulations. But it's always been our position that we, the IEEE, cannot be the gatekeeper. It's up to the author and his or her institution, and actually they probably said his institution in those days, uh, to uh, a good example of how we're continuing to advance ethically and in many other ways. And one of the things I propose in the book is, it's so easy to see where we were unethical 200 years ago, like Thomas Jefferson selling human beings to pay his debts. What today are we doing that 100 years from now will be viewed as unethical? We ought to look at that, because we won't see everything, but we can advance our... Uh, uh, progress as a, a species and as a civilization. So the IEEE writes back, we're well aware, but it's always been our position that the authors and their institutions have to uh, uh, watch out for this. So I take the letter to Stanford's general counsel for two reasons. One, Stanford is potentially liable. Two, if I'm going to be prosecuted, I want Stanford's financial backing because this would bankrupt me. And I'll never forget the conversation I had with uh, John Schwartz was his name after he reviewed the material. He said, it's my legal opinion that if the ITAR, the International Traffic and Arms Regulation, is viewed broadly enough to cover your work, it's unconstitutional, because that would be a violation of freedom of speech, freedom of the press. But I've got to warn you that this is just my legal opinion. The only way to settle this is in a court of law, and if you're prosecuted, we will defend you. If you uh, are uh, convicted, we will appeal. But I also have to warn you, we can't go to jail for you. But with Stanford's, oh, he also recommended, we had two papers coming up. This is July 77, October. So three months later at the next IEEE trans, um, Symposium on Information Theory in Cornell University. I had two papers, one with Steve Pollug and one with Ralph Merkel. And he said, I strongly recommend that the students not give the papers as we were planning. Uh, but to, that I give the papers for two reasons. It wasn't clear Stanford could defend a student, whereas I was an agent of the university. Plus, he pointed out from a practical point of view, a newly minted PhD's career would have great difficulty withstanding a multi-year court case, which this might become. I went to the students, and they very courageously said, oh, we'll give the paper anyway. But about a week later, they each come back to me, and their mothers were beating on them. <laughs> And they said, to make my mother happy, would you give the paper? So when it came time at Cornell, and everyone knew what was going on, I had Ralph and then Steve for each paper come up, and I said, for legal reasons, the student is not giving the paper, but he is the first author. I want you to consider the words coming from my mouth in every way except legally, as if they're coming from his. And the students got more attention that way than they ever would have gotten by giving the paper. OK, 
Okay, resolution begins. Let me see how I'm doing. 34 minutes. Yeah, I'm almost done bad on time. Um, in 1978, I think in the spring, I get a call from the director's office at NSA. So this is a year after the Meyer uh, stuff. Bobby Inman, Admiral Inman, had come in as director of NSA, <clears throat> and he's an out-of-the-box thinker. He's a really good man, as you'll see in this story. And he, his office called and said, the director was going to be in California. He'd like to meet with you if you're willing. Would you? And I jumped at the opportunity because we had never been talking directly. It was all being fought in the press and never with NSA. It was letters like Meyer from his home address, you know, that kind of thing. So Inman comes to my office, and he looks a couple weeks later, and he looks at me and says, hey, nice to see you don't have horns. Because that's how I was being portrayed within NSA. I was the devil incarnate. And I looked back at him, because I had the reverse view, and I said, same here. <laughs> he also told me that he was meeting with me against the advice of all the other senior people at the agency. But he said, I don't see the harm in talking. Again, you can see the out-of-the-box thinking. And out of that meeting grew a cautious relationship, which eventually became a friendship. And uh, it, as an example, well, I'll go on. Well, I'll tell you now. About 10 years ago, I started working on risk analysis of nuclear deterrence. Society, including Obama and Kerry, treated nuclear deterrence as if it would work forever. Kerry said, nuclear deterrence remains the cornerstone of America's national security in one of his speeches. And, well, that's okay if we could expect nuclear deterrence to work for 100 million years before it failed. But if it could only work for 1,000 years or 100 years before it failed, 1% per year or a tenth of a percent per year risk destroying civilization, that's not adequate. And I, no one had done an analysis, and I started working on this. I uh, pulled together a statement of support, and I wanted some prominent people to sign it. And I got six very prominent people, including Bob Inman. And now, he wouldn't have signed it if he didn't agree, but he also wouldn't have, have signed it if we were still adversaries. So now I've got that. So one of the lessons is it's better to have friends than enemies. Now, of course, everybody knows this. But how many people do what Admiral Inman did, which is to risk meeting with the person who's being portrayed as the devil incarnate? How many times do we have conflicts with our um, co-workers, maybe even our parents, our children, our, our, our uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, spouses? How often do we actually try to understand their perspective? How many of us say, I don't see the harm in talking? Let me try to understand your perspective. And this played a key role in my wife and I not only saving our marriage, which was in great danger in 1980, 13 years into it, when we started a process, it's resulted where today we haven't had a single fight in well over 15 years, which I did not think was possible. We still disagree, but we see disagreements as an opportunity to learn from one another, find better solutions, because she's seeing it differently from me. Um, but it's better to have friends than enemies. And so really keep that in mind the next time you're really mad at somebody. Resolution grows. 1993, Congress requested a National Research Council study of cryptographic policy. The result is a report called the Crisis Report, Cryptography's Role in Securing the Information Society. And it included myself, an advocate for privacy. It included um, um, Ray Ozzie, who became the chief software architect at, at Microsoft after uh, Bill Gates stepped down, representing industry. It included Benjamin Civiletti, a former attorney general, representing the FBI and law enforcement's interests. It included Ann Cara Christie, who had been deputy director of NSA, uh, representing national security interests. And we reached unanimous conclusions in spite of those differences, partly because we dropped our preconceived frames of reference and really talked with one another as uh, trying to solve a common problem. We recommended a relaxation of export restrictions, not to North Korea. Actually, I would have preferred to see it to Cuba as well, but that wasn't going to happen. So we all compromised a bit. All these things occurred within about a year afterward. We don't know for sure how much of a role this report played, but it certainly didn't hurt, and I'm sure it helped. We also concluded that the classified information, oh, I did take an intelligence clearance for this study because Congress had directed the DOD to give us all classified information they felt was relevant to uh, reaching the proper conclusion here. 
And so there were a few people that didn't take clearances, so we had some unclassified briefings. And in those unclassified briefings, we had people say what they always say. If you knew what I knew, you'd think differently. Well, we concluded exactly the opposite. The classified information was largely irrelevant. It gave us details, but it did not change our overall conclusions. So when someone tells you, if you knew what I knew, you'd think differently, refer back to the crisis report and tell them, you may be right, but uh, there's a strong question about that. We also, oh, key escrow, the clipper chip, things like that, those of you who remember this from 20, 30, 25 years ago, um, the government was really pushing something called key escrow, which is very similar to this um, exceptional access that they've been pushing in more recent years. And we spent days trying to figure out how key escrow might work, because it was very similar then to now. They say, we just want legitimate access when we have a court order. But they never said how you could do that without hurting security. And eventually, I, think, I like to think I'm the one who recommended it, but of course, since it puts me in a good light, I'm probably wrong. Uh, anyway, the committee concluded, we can't see how to do this. Let's throw it back. So the report says the government should experiment with key escrow for its own purposes, and if it finds solutions to the problems that we've been unable to solve, come back to us at that point. They never came back, except they've come back with roughly the same thing uh, several years ago. That, that is the same problem in the same way of put, phrasing it. So this talk has been about the evolution of public key cryptography, but it also shows personal evolution. Uh, I'm a really different person today from the 30-year-old who battled NSA 40 years ago and who battled my wife 40 years ago. And one of the things to remember is get curious, not furious. That's what Inman did when he said, I don't see the harm in talking. And remember, friends are better than enemies, so put some energy into turning seeming adversaries into friends by trying to understand their perspective, dropping your own. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marty, for a remarkable talk, not just about research and your pioneering work, but about life. I'm sure we have a lot of questions. Questions for Professor Hellman. Anyone? There's a question. Are there um, any implications from what I've talked about today to security breaches occurring everywhere? Uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll add a little something to the talk, and then the answer will be absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> for 40 years, I've been saying that whenever you're designing a system that has just two possibilities, being secure or insecure, you should include secure or insecure in the definition. So, for example, imagine when the first cell phones were designed, if they said, we're going to design an insecure cell phone, and they put big banners up at stores, buy your insecure cell phone here, <laughs> they would have realized that's ridiculous. We wouldn't have had the squidgy affair, which some of you remember. That was Prince Charles talking to uh, uh, his mistress uh, on the phone and intercepted. Uh, and so the same is true with the Internet of Things. Do we want a secure Internet of Things or an insecure Internet of Things? Do we want a, smart, do we want a secure smart grid or an insecure smart grid, which is a dumb grid? And we need to be uh, uh, doing that, and we're, we're, and we're not, and we haven't been doing it for 40 years. Uh, another problem is um, what I call um, a cyber, cyber hygiene. I get emails from my banks and at least once a week saying your statement is available here or something else. Click and log in to see it. They are training me and everyone else that they send this to to fall for phishing expeditions. I always go to my bookmarks and log in. So there are a lot of things we could be doing that are very simple uh, that we're not. Good practical advice. Uh, Professor Hellman alluded to several times in this talk about the book, A New Map for Relationships, which he and his wife Dorothy wrote. And uh, I received one of the first copies, signed, which I treasured, and I read it, and I could not put the book down. I mean, here you are, you're a, a computer scientist, an engineer, born in Brooklyn. And actually, no, born, actually, born in Manhattan, Beth Israel Hospital, brought up in the Bronx, so I shouldn't, oh, be, in okay. I shouldn't be in Brooklyn at all. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying that. Well, we're glad you're in Brooklyn now. And since NYU engineering is yes. in Brooklyn, we're going to claim you. But um, what's amazing is you've done all this research, you, you had these battles, I mean, and you showed us today how students and papers and pushing your will 
and your vision, how it's timing, how you have to persist. Yet you and Dorothy came up with this new map for relationship. Maybe in the last few minutes you could talk about that book, that inspiration, because all these stories, meeting Admiral Lindman and a lot of your quest is in the book. It's amazing reading. Well, and the RSA stuff is in the book. And actually, I wouldn't have made peace with RSA. Ron Rivest, uh, all three of them, and Jim Bidzos, who I didn't mention, the president of the company, uh, who uh, I really was angry at. Uh, and there's a story in there where someone comes to me when I'm still angry at them and says, you help me do something, and we'll get those RSA bastards by the balls. Those, he talked that way. Yeah. And I was so angry at them at the time, not like now, that I was afraid I would make the decision for a reason... Wrong reasons, reasons, wrong reasons, yeah. and there's a story of how Dorothy helped me figure out not to do that. So I feel unbelievably blessed. I mean, I grew up as this kid in the Bronx. The idea of ever being a professor at, uh, at a major university, much less winning these awards, was beyond my comprehension. If God had asked me to write a script <clears throat> when I was you know, 15, 20 years old, I never could have written a script. But the part that I'm, the, the thing that I've accomplished that I'm most proud of, you don't win awards for other than from my wife, uh, which is making that relationship work. I mean, it is really bringing a little bit of heaven down to earth. And so I strongly, we hope, one of the reasons we wrote the book is we want more people to have that opportunity because well, I remember saying to Dorothy as we were going through this process, now we've been married 51 years, so not having had a fight in maybe 20 years, it sounds like a long time, but there's a long time to get there. I'll have what you're having. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, and um, what I, I asked her many times after we'd made a lot of progress, I said, what do you want from me? And she couldn't actually put it into words. And if she told me what it was, I want you to bring a little bit of heaven down to earth. I want a relationship where we work together and when we have differences of opinion, it becomes an opportunity to learn rather than fight. I wouldn't have believed it. And so the one thing I hope here is that some of you will believe me and then you will believe it is possible because that was one of the first steps. It's, Dorothy calls it the on-ramp to the new map. Oh, and it's called the new map because the first story in the book, she gets so mad at me, this is 30 years ago, she rips a map out of my hand, so it's a paper map, and tears it to shreds all over the car. And uh, it ends with both of us laughing at how ridiculous we've been behaving because I had provoked her to do that. Uh, and Dorothy couldn't put into words what it was, but she says the first step, the on-ramp to the new map is believing that it's possible. And... We had to discover it on our own because we didn't have any role models. I'm sure there are people who have done it, but we hadn't seen any write-ups. And so we hope that our book will help that way. And the other important thing is this same getting curious, not furious, is essential at the international level. And we, the book is melding the two together. Uh, because if we, do, if we continue to get mad at North Korea, for example, over the, like you, if you read the New York Times, you believe that North Korea cannot be trusted with nuclear agreements. They say that repeatedly. They're absolutely wrong. North Korea will push the limits of a nuclear agreements. But if you read the North Korea section of our book, which has easily verified information, like you can go to the State Department website and see the agreement that Bush accused them of cheating on by enriching uranium, you will find that neither the word uranium nor enrichment appears anywhere in there. Now, it's a little more complicated than that. But we need to really do this. If we're going to survive, if we keep doing, you know, getting into fights internationally, eventually one's going to blow up and we'll destroy ourselves. So this is really an opportunity to not only save the world, but make it a better world and make better lives for ourselves. Marty, thank you so much. A new map for relationships is the book. Marty Hellman, NYU alumnus, a change maker. Let's give him a huge hand. Thank you for coming.